psalms that talk about thanksgiving, being thankful. This isn't one of them. <laughs> but I do th- look at it as a thanksgiving psalm. It is, first and foremost, a messianic psalm, a psalm that is talking about Jesus Christ. And we will look at this entire psalm. We will look at it through uh, seeing Jesus in it. But then I will also look at it as a psalm for us that we can be thankful for. Let's read through Psalm 40. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor shall turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us word, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou dost not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me. O Lord, let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head, therefore my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backwards and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for reward of their shame that say unto me, Aha, aha. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tearing, O my God. This is a messianic psalm, and it starts off talking about the resurrection, how that Jesus himself would rise from the dead. Verses 1 and 2, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Thou brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. I am thankful that Jesus Christ was resurrected. I am thankful that the resurrection is a true fact because he rose from the dead. We shall rise from the dead as well. It is not something that we hope for. It is not something that we think that the atheist that when we die, it's just it. We just die and turn back to dust and there's nothing left. There is an afterlife, there is a resurrection, there is a coming a time when, when we die, and unless the rapture happens, we all are going to die, that we will come up out of that grave. Because he was the firstborn, the first fruits of the resurrection, and we also will be resurrected with him. There will be praise for the resurrection. Verses 3 and fi- three through 5. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. 
Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I were to declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. There will be a new song when we get to heaven. The book of Revelation tells us that. A new song that will be given to us during the resurrection. During that time when we come and see Christ, it'll all be brand new to us. It'll be a song we have never sung before. It'll be a song of praise. It'll be a song of praise because of what he did on the cross. It'll be a song of praise because we are with him in heaven. It'll be a song of praise because we have been resurrected. Life everlasting. Eternal life up in heaven. When I think of this world, what's going on in this world, and how with each passing day, each passing week, month, and year, it seems like things are getting worse. It seems like sin is getting more and more out of control. It seems like people are losing their minds, it seems like. I think of heaven, and I think of how wonderful that will be. I think of how there will be no more sin. There will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more heartache, no more death, no more aging, no more illnesses. All the things that we have to deal with today is going to be a thing of the past. And that's something to sing about. That's something to praise God about. The old system was not good enough. This is still during the Old Testament times when this was written. This Psalm of David is still a time when the sacrifices were still happening. The sacrifices that were set up in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those sacrifices for the sin offerings for the peace offerings, the meat offerings, the drink offerings, all those offerings that they had to make, that was still going on at the time that this was written. And in those first five books, when those sacrifices are laid out, it is very specific how it should be done. Uh, God gave very specific directions when you uh, go to offer the bullock. You were to cut it up this way. You were to use this part of it. You were to burn this part, throw this part out, not use this part, use this part, use this part for meat. And there were very specific directions involving the sacrifice. And all of that was pointing to Christ. All of that was pointing to a time when Jesus would come to this earth and be nailed to a cross and become the sacrifice, the Passover lamb. Uh, the book of Exodus tells us the Passover, gives us the first Passover there in Egypt as they were trying to escape the clutches of Pharaoh and Pharaoh would not let them go. God instituted the Passover, and it was a picture of the cross. Every bit of it was a picture of the cross from the blood that was put on the doorpost and the mantle. It was put here, here, and here. Put that together, you got a cross. To the very sacrifice itself of the lamb, it had to be a spotless lamb, a perfect lamb, a lamb without blemish. It was picturing Christ. And here David writes about how this system that was used not to take away sins, but to cover the sins of the people until Messiah came. Here he writes, looking forward to that time, looking ahead to that time when these sacrifices will no longer be needed. This is verses 6 and 7. The sacrifice and offerings 
thou dost not desire, mine ear hast thou opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. David here is looking ahead to a time when this would be put away, when the one true sacrifice, the one true offering would come. Paul writes about it in Hebrews chapter 10, not looking ahead, but looking back at what David was looking forward to. Verse number one says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. It wasn't able to make them perfect. It was just an image. For then would they have not ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh unto the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering, thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices, for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifices and offering, and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst thou pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So David was writing, looking ahead in time, Paul writing, looking back. One was looking forward to the event. One was writing about the event that already had happened, Christ dying on the cross. This new sacrifice would take its place. Verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Jesus came specifically to die on the cross. Uh, when he prayed there in the garden, he said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He knew his purpose. He knew why he had come. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me. O Lord, let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me. Christ had no iniquities, but he took our iniquities on him. And my iniquity was too much for me to handle. And yet he took the iniquities of the entire world and placed them upon his shoulders. If I couldn't handle my own, I can just imagine how the weight of the entire world's sins must have felt upon him. Therefore my heart faileth me, it says. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backwards and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for a reward of their shame that say unto me, Aha, aha, let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tearing, O oh my God. That is Jesus in that psalm. And it's a beautiful psalm. And now I want to kind of make it our psalm, a psalm for us. 
how we can be thankful through this psalm. The first thing I see is that we were lost and needed help. The Bible tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All means all. <laughs> Nobody is exempt. Everybody who has ever been born is in need of salvation. Everybody who has ever lived life has fallen short of the glory of God. Again, verses 1 and 2 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my going. We were all in need of salvation. But when we came to Jesus, he lifted us up out of that miry pit, set us down on a solid rock. And that solid rock is Jesus. That solid rock is Jesus Christ. And he has given us the greatest gift. Christmas is coming up, and we're all already thinking about who, what we're going to get so-and-so for Christmas this year because it's a time of giving of gifts. And Jesus has given us the greatest gift ever, salvation. And it cost him dearly. It cost him his life. It cost him dying on the cross to buy back our salvation. If we were to do a study on the crucifixion, as bad as we could make it sound, it was so much worse. What he went through dying on that cross is so much worse than we can imagine. I remember many years ago when they made that film, The Passion of the Christ, and people, uh, critics said, it's too gory, it's too horrible. And I thought, it's not horrible enough. What they depicted in that movie couldn't have been as bad as it really was. It had to have been much, much worse. And he did that because we were lost and because we needed help and because we needed salvation. And he was willing to do that for us. So I am thankful that he saved us, that he was willing to save us, to make that price. We can sing a new song of praise, verse 3. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praises unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. When we become Christians, singing the songs of Christianity, the hymns, the spiritual songs, the psalms, as the Bible tells us, is not an unnatural thing. If you've never known Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're sitting in church and you're maybe trying to sing along with the, the uh, hymns that are being sung, you might know the words, you might know the music, but it doesn't really mean anything to you. And when you become a Christian, they all make sense. They all have a meaning. They all have a purpose, and you are blessed by it. And it's not uncommon to have a tear well up in your eye. We have been given a love for a new song, a song of praise. And we want to sing about our Savior. Nothing is going to help you through your day more than singing even if it's just to yourself, the songs of Christ. I told our congregation this. I said, living over in Indianapolis, you have to deal with a lot of traffic. <laughs> and I found that when I would listen to gospel music while driving down the road, it was a lot harder to get road rage. Because you're listening to something that is wonderful. You're listening to something that lifts your soul. And if people are passing you and cutting you off, it doesn't seem to bother you quite as much. It's a good 
good tip for driving down the road. <laughs> we are blessed in the Lord. Verse number four. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor shall turn aside to lies. We have a blessing from being a Christian. All of us can probably tell stories and give testimonies of times when things were not so good in our lives. But God worked something out. And maybe just smile and say, only God. Only God could have done that. When life seems at its lowest, and maybe you have a bill that you can't pay, that you weren't expecting, your car breaks down, your refrigerator goes out, and you think, where am I going to get the money for this? And then God just provides. And it's a wonderful thing to see that. And when that happens, we need to be vocal about it. We need to let people know, look at what my God did for me today. Look at how he provided for me today. What a wonderful blessing it is to be a Christian. And when people will see how good God is, then maybe they will back off of their perception that we as Christians are just trying to shove religion down their throat. It's not that at all. We have something wonderful, and we want them to have it as well. I use an example. If someone was giving away some tickets to a Illini football game, Illini basketball game. So they had 100 tickets, and I said, well, I'll, I'll take five tickets. I can use five tickets. They said, okay, they're here. They're free. And then I call up somebody else and say, this guy over here has got some free tickets to the Illini game. You might want to jump on that. Why? Because I found something that I thought was a value, and I thought someone else might want part of that as well. That's what it's like when we talk to people about Christ. We have experienced something wonderful, and he has blessed us, and we need to let them know so that they can experience that blessing as well. We have been given many gifts in Christ. Verse number five, many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us word, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. As we think of this time of Thanksgiving, and we think maybe to ourselves what God has done for us, the gifts that he has bestowed upon us this past year. If we really sat down, or maybe at the beginning of the year, and a journal started writing down everything that God did for us. You might have to buy three or four journals. Because he does so much for us. And then at the end of the year, we can pick those up and look at them and read through them again and see what God has done for us through that year. We might be surprised. Because we forget things. <laughs> I mean, a year's a long time. <laughs> And we forget things that happen on a daily basis in our lives. But if we were to write it down, it'd be innumerable. Though our sins are many, he is able to save us. Verse 12. For numerable evils have compassed me about my iniquity, have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs on my head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. Then we think about how sinful we are. The iniquities that are in our lives, they are innumerable. There are more, it says, than the hairs 
on our head. So much so that the weight of it makes it where it's hard to even look up to God. When we think about how sinful we have been compared to how righteous and holy he is. So that our heart fails us. Our heart faileth us. But the good news is he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter how sinful we have been, no matter how sinful we will be, if we ask for forgiveness, he's faithful and just, and he will forgive us. Finally, we see that we are in his thoughts. Verse 17 says, But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer, Make no tearing, O oh my God. I think we all would agree that we are poor and needy. Spiritually, physically, and it says, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. We are in his thoughts. He is thinking about us. About me, you, 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 all of us, all the time, night and day, he never sleeps in slumbers, while we sleep and are resting, he's thinking about us. Many people go to sleep and never wake up. Pass over into eternity while sleeping. God is thinking about us even in our sleep. No matter what is going on, He is preparing the way for us. If you have I mentioned it earlier, an unexpected bill that came up. That seems to be our biggest problems here in America, isn't it? Finances. <laughs> that unexpected bill you weren't expecting shows up and you put it off because you don't have the money and then it's due the next day. And you're like, where am I going to get the money for this? And then someone comes up to you and says, God put this burden on my heart. I want to give you this. Or you go to your mailbox and there's an unexpected check in the mailbox. You've been praying for this. Saying, Lord, this is due tomorrow. I don't have the money. And he's already sent the money ahead of time before you even prayed about it. Because he knew already the need was going to be there. He knows more about us than we know about ourselves. Because he's constantly thinking about us. So what can we be thankful for this Thanksgiving? We can be thankful that though we were lost and needy, he was willing to save us. We can be thankful that he's given us a new song to sing in our hearts. We can be thankful that we are blessed in the Lord because we trusted in him. We can be thankful for the gifts which are many. We can be thankful that we have a new life and a new purpose. And that our sins, though they are many, he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins. And we can be thankful that he's always thinking about us and knows all about us and knows how to handle the crisis that is in our lives. Some things that I'm thankful for over this past year. Uh, our church is a small church, smaller than this church. It's been a small church for as long as I've been there. 
after COVID, it was down to just a few of us. I am thankful that this year we have seen growth in the church, new people coming, and not just coming, but continually coming and being faithful. And that's a blessing to see that as a pastor. I'm thankful for the opportunities God has given me this year to help out in ministry here tonight over in Indiana and right there in Paris, Illinois. I'm thankful for his faithfulness even when we aren't always as faithful to him as we should be. I'm thankful first for salvation and for his word. We can depend on it. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father.